Forward Guidance is brought to you by VanEck, a global leader in asset management since 1955. You'll be hearing more about VanEck ETFs later on, but for now, let's get into today's interview. Got a very special episode today. I am joined once again by the man known only as Citrini, uh, by his handle on Twitter, at Citrini7. Citrini made some uh, incredible calls on, on the, the bull market, and he's, a, he's an active trader. When I had him on last in June of 2023, the bull market in stocks, and particularly in AI, stock, in AI stocks, was just getting started. God, what was the company that you were long that did has, has done ridiculously well? Micro? The super Micro, yeah. Oh, yeah. Still yeah, trading at a yeah, 6%. Super Micro was, was uh, cheap, and now it's up 300%, and it's still... Uh, price earnings ratio Still cheap. but it appeared that it might uh, you know be a little bit of a bubble and it might have been the, the top but james came on and said no and he talked about several stocks that he liked that had got that had gone up a lot and since then they have gone up a lot lot more so welcome back good to see you man jack what's going on man since you recorded in june 2nd 2023 Several of the stocks that you talked about have gone have surged. Super Micro up 138%, Fabernet up 85%, Elf Beauty up 51%, and Nvidia up 56%. And by the way, I say this is what they're up since our last interview. You had been bullish on these stocks for a long time, and you know Super Micro is up. What is that a ten bagger since you bought it? Yeah, I, I, the first time I bought, I like posted about Super Micro that I was buying it, it was in August twenty two. First shares that I bought were at fifty six, so just about you know just about there. And so fifty six and what what Super Micro? Let's see right now is that like six hundred or something? No, I think it, 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 yeah, five seventy five. So it's, so it's pretty good. So James. I want to ask, what are your thoughts on it now? You know, you, you made a prediction. It played out. I'm going to say not just how you expected, probably even better than you had expected. You know, you had good expectations. Obviously, you wouldn't have done the trade, but I'm um, given how good it's been. It's probably you know even better than your your high expectations. But how are you? What was that like? And what are you thinking now? You know, I'm thinking it's, it's okay. This thing is maybe getting a little overheated. Time to take some chips off the table. Or nope. You know, the secular trends I see are still in play. So I'm still I'm still long. The way that I approach any of these is the Gartner hype cycle, right? It's kind of like basically kind of what like Soros talks about and the idea that if you have a bubble, theoretically, right, if you're the best trader in the world and the best market timer, it gives you three opportunities to make a ton of money, right? You, if you get long early, if you get short at kind of the peak of inflated expectations, and then again, you know, if you get long at the what's called the trough of disillusionment. When everyone is kind of convinced that, convinced by the bus that, you know, nothing is real and it's this technology is going to work, you know, saw with the dot com bubble, kind of saw it with the nifty 50 in the 70s. It's so right now, I mean, you know, I, I, I'm not a true believer in anything, right? I, I, I'm a, I'm a market participant and my loyalties are, you know, to the number on my screen, right? My, my p &L. And I'm not going to hold these forever, right? The, just because AI is a thing doesn't mean that semiconductors aren't cyclical anymore. And the other thing with these kinds of megatrends is they change really rapidly. You know, the, the, their new technologies, their, the wider they get, the more adoption that they get, the quicker the theme changes and the quicker the technology changes. So super micro was, you know, done great. First off, it was way too cheap. It's, it's still kind of cheap relative to, you know, it's, it's probably in the next four years, it'll be doing 25 billion in annual revenue. But the thing is, it's run up a ton and, you know, so I have a lot of uh, these other names and now the task is basically going to be twofold. The first thing is where does this get to the point where the market has taken it way too far. And the other thing is going to be how do we kind of anticipate how this trend or theme or technology is going to evolve to create new winners, right? The last time that I came on kind of was focused on the picks and shovels. You know, if AI is going to be a thing, what needs to exist in order for that to continue to happen? Uh, what companies and names benefit as long as AI is a thing just by selling what they need in order to do AI. Now it gets a little trickier, right? Now it's uh, who are the adopters going to be? Who are the winners going to be? Who's going to democratize this technology? 
and what is the technology going to look like you know so that's kind of where we're at right now so you you started off by talking about a George Soros concept about bubbles and basically how to to make money from bubbles and I think that I just want to frame for the audience that you you are not as cynical as that initial statement might suggest. Like, in other words, you are not a true believer in anything, but you do think that there is a fundamental shift there in artificial intelligence. In other words, oh, absolutely, I, yeah. I, I want to say, you know, I I think my mind, perhaps some others as well, was poisoned by in 2020 and 2021. There was so much speculative crap that went public right. with promises of we're going to grow our revenue at 70 percent and the companies were just allowed to put this in investor documents and because SPACs allowed it because the SEC was fucking asleep. And, <laughs> then, you know, so I feel like 90% of the hype and promises that I saw, you know, oh, the, your, your revenue didn't double year over year. Oh, actually, you know, your, your stock got delisted and you go went bankrupt and you screwed over everyone. Like, I feel like this time around, I'm actually seeing some real, you know, I'm not saying I'm tracking these companies, yeah. but I'm looking at NVIDIA and it goes up 60%. And everyone says it's, you know, a bubble or people on Twitter say it's a bubble, they doubt it. And that's my instinct, too. But then I look, okay, the revenue is up 60% too, in year over year. And I think like the net income for the third quarter, you know, went up 800%. And of course, that's, uh, you know, base effect. So it's not, it's not that good. But like, I, I the fundamental story of AI in terms of the revenue and monetization, for picks and shovels, that has, what did you say, already occurred in 2023, for a lot of the stuff that's being built out, it hasn't been monetized yet, but I mean, you know, Super Micro, it didn't, it didn't go up. Obviously, it's gotten more expensive, but its earnings and and revenue went up a lot. I mean, you can give us the numbers, right? Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, the thing is, I think the reason why it, the the rise in you know these AI stocks has been so violent is basically because of exactly what you just described. I remember probably around, you know, it was funny actually. Yours was the first podcast I ever did, and. I mean, go look at some of those YouTube comments. <laughs> they are not friendly. And I got, you know, a lot of kind of flack on Twitter, basically. And I remember saying to someone that was, you know, very, very bearish on on the idea that anything in tech was going to go up, that, you know, you're going to miss one of the most revolutionary advances in technology and one of the best potentials to make money in the stock market in the past decade because you're jaded by a bunch of, you know, zero interest rate policy phenomenon BS, you know, and there were a lot of people that were like that. And that's the reason why, it, like, like, you know, people need to understand, I think that, yes, yeah, so there, there's a fundamental story here. At the same time, the entire reason that those fundamentals, you know, that Meta has gone from being one of the cheapest stocks in the entire market to, you know, what it is today, this quickly it's basically because of the fact that everyone was implicitly short. You know, I said this on the first time we met that like, we're going to have a, you know, the, the long only people are going to get short squeezed because they were so underweight, all the stocks that benefited from this. They weren't actually short, but they didn't own as much. And as the stocks that are legit AI go up in value, they become a larger percentage of, if not the S&P 500 index, then some index. So they are not. They're not short. They're they're underweight. And that's right. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. When when you're when you're running, you know, some uh, long only equity book. Every single day you come in and you uh, decide, you know, to be underweight something, you know, relative to the index. You're getting measured based on your benchmark, right? So if your benchmark is the index, and uh, you know, at the end of the quarter, you're going to get, you know, measured up against it. You kind of are short. Obviously, you're not short in the classical sense, but you, you know, you kind of are. So that's basically what happened. Now I would say that aspect, you know, the positioning aspect, it's not there anymore. Everyone has kind of come around on this. Now the now the task becomes how do we anticipate when the, the quote unquote bubble has gotten too disconnected from fundamentals. Like you said, you know, Supermicro has seen insane, you know, insane uh, same thing with Nvidia and it will spread out, you know, I think that it'll probably start spreading out to uh high bandwidth memory. It'll spread out a little bit more to the, you know, optical there basically will come a point though where it gets too insane. Right now, I think UBS is predicting that like AI industry revenue will grow to, you know, 420 billion, right? Which is an easy number to remember. And that's a 40% increase, right? From its prior view. And it's a 72% CAGR from 2022 over the next, you know, five years. And that's still kind of conservative by, you know, bubble standards. These are, these are like actually genuinely achievable goals. 
if we're actually going to go into an AI bubble, it can get a lot crazier. Like, do you, you, I don't know if you've like read a lot about the the telecom bubble of like the early two thousands, where you know at one point the analysts basically the sell side was modeling everybody on earth with two cell phones, right? Pe- people in two thousand were spending you know. 10% of disposable income on internet access. And if you were to listen to the analysts at the peak of the bubble, they would have been spending 60% of their disposable income on internet access today. <laughs> you know, and they, obviously that's not what happened, you know, because these, you know, revolutionary technologies get commoditized quickly, you know? So right now, if the, if the base case of the average market participant is that AI is going to be the size of the entire current global semiconductor market, and uh, you know, four times the current annual capex of every hyperscaler combined, maybe. But is there room for that to? Because the thing is, the peak of the bubble isn't going to happen where it's like very obvious that the fundamentals are disconnected, right? It, the way that it's going to happen is essentially when the fundamentals, if you do a little bit of mental gymnastics, are justifiable, right? Uh-huh. Like, like it's a, it's going to be a question of basically how far will the estimates go because you have to realize how crazy it can get when you have analysts saying every single co- you know every company in their coverage is a share winner right and 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 now you you're looking yeah. across the you know the, what the analysts are saying and you have five companies that are going to have 60% market share you know yeah and there, there are i think the analysts maybe have an incentive to say everyone's a winner whereas you are not that you say oh i like this i like this i like this here are some right. other losers that i'm either not going to own or i'm going to short against the longs and so, for example, I'm looking at like super micro. So it's forward PE. So based on estimates is like 26. So it's still cheaper than Chipotle on, you know, a forward earning basis. Oh, yeah. Now, Chipotle may have can, can justify that. But there definitely are companies like, you know, Intel or other like semiconductor companies that, you know, you do not think the fundamentals are there. So it's not a, a pan. Let, let, me, let, let, let me be clear, right? The last time I was on this podcast was nine months ago, right? So if we're saying, you know, in nine months, I'm going to come back, right? Like I... Right now, I think that these estimates are achievable, right? Like super micro probably is trading at, you know, 20 to 25 times it's, you know, 2025, 20, 2026 earnings, right? It's very easy for it to do 25 billion in revenue. But then let, you know, let's think about the fact that this kind of is where you have to start getting a lot more selective, right? It was, it, you could have, it, the first, when I came on this podcast the first time, you could have basically bought the NASDAQ or you could have bought the Vanex Semiconductor ETF. If you would have done the research and, you know, you know, you would have been selective about the picks and shovel stocks that you bought, you would have outperformed significantly, but you would have still performed pretty well if you just did that, right? And, but now the question becomes, how is this, you know, technology going to progress, right? And, and, when it comes to you know Nvidia and Supermicro and the you know these picks and shovels plays, we have you have to kind of anticipate that the technology will change rapidly. The idea that when this you know in like the first half of last year it was very expensive to train and do inference on a large language model, that's slowly kind of becoming commoditized. These things are becoming cheaper, and not just that, but you know right now you have Microsoft, Amazon. Google, they see competitive threats and they're kind of in a, if you build it, they will come, right? That's the, that's basically their strategy right now, which is, which is great for, you know, the picks and shovels producers, but it's also dangerous if, you know, you get a little bit of a downside surprise. And that, that doesn't mean that like, it's, it's not time to short AI yet, right? But it's time to start thinking about where, when are we going to get too disconnected and when is the technology going to shift? to the point where those disconnects start being reflected in the fundamental. I don't know if you saw the article with Sam Altman, you know, he's uh, trying to raise money to basically start a semiconductor company, right? Or, you know, the fact like Meta is Meta, all the, all the hyperscalers, they're working on their own custom silicon. NVIDIA recognizes this. They're trying to defend against it. They're trying that they are the only game in town right now. So they're trying to ensure that their biggest customers are companies that will not cut them out of the value chain or the supply chain. Whereas a company like Meta is going to try to basically, oh, you know, right now we have to buy GPUs from NVIDIA, but 
what if we can build our own and what if we can make them, you know, application specific? What if we can make specific chips that will just do AI or maybe not even just AI, just the AI that we need those chips to do, right? So, and, and, and what happens now is, you know, first off, these stocks were really, really cheap, right? Like Meta was so cheap. Supermicro was so cheap. NVIDIA was so cheap. Now they're either fair valued or maybe a little bit expensive. And now the dispersion starts where, you, you know, if you want to play the, the easy money so far has been made in AI being along the picks and shovels. If you, if you want to play this going forward, it's going to get a little trickier in terms of like within the picks and shovels, you know, where are we looking, right? You know, like where are the picks and shovels for the picks and shovels? Every single custom silicon, the, the ASICs that they're making, every SMCI server that's using, you know, NVIDIA GPUs or AMD GPUs, it, it's going to need a ton of memory, right? HBM, it, you know, ba even basic edge AI is going to need a ton more, you know, uh, DDR5 memory. And if you go in, into the market and you look at what AMD and Marvell and Broadcom and like related stocks did on like just a few months of upward revisions of like a few hundred thousand units, it's insane. And what, you know, and that can happen to these other sectors like, you know, memory or optics, names like Marvell and Sienna and, and uh, Coherent or SK Hynix and Micron. It's and and at the same time, it's very sensitive to the macro cycle, you know, and I know that this is like a macro economically focused podcast. And, you know, it's kind of we're seeing I, I don't know, at least I think I'm I would love to hear based on the guests that you've had on what, what's your take on the economy right now? Do you think that we're going to have a recession? That is the question. Last year, inflation fell a lot more than growth fell. So real growth was really high. And yeah, we objectively were not in a recession. The labor market was very strong, weakening, but from a very strong level. Consumer spending weakening, but from a very, high, very, very strong level. You know, consumer delinquencies, credit issues rising, but from an extremely low level. So yeah, I mean, if those continue, maybe we could have a again. Or the difference between a a slow session, a mild recession, it's it's kind of uh, you know uh, hazy. I guess the real issue is is the labor market. So I. So my, the, the real answer, Trini, is I, I don't know. And, you know, no, no one knows. <laughs> in the same way, you know, you don't know. And the smartest people don't know about what's going to happen to all these stocks. But you, you, you try and have a, a good idea. Like gold did, Bitcoin is establishing itself as a macro asset that potentially helps hedge against the government devaluation of your money. Finally, you can easily access Bitcoin in a low cost ETF with the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Search the ticker HODL in your brokerage app today. Visit vanek.com slash HODLFG to learn more. That's vanek.com slash HODLFG. Now the disclosures. Investing involves risk and you could lose money on an investment in the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, also known as the Trust or HODL. The value of Bitcoin and therefore the value of the trust shares could decline rapidly, including to zero. You could lose your entire principal investment. For a more complete discussion of the risk factors relative to the trust, carefully read the prospectus link below. Thanks, let's get back to the interview. I, we will we will get into the macro, I, I promise. But I just have a, a few <laughs> questions about the general market. So it sounds like you you mentioned a few ideas you like that are like the picks and shovels to the picks and shovels. But I want to you know because you know this is a macro show. Let's talk about the big big whopper big whopper stocks that are in the S and P five hundred. You know, Supermicro is not really moving the S and P five hundred. Nvidia mm -hmm. is. So are you know Apple, Microsoft, Google, Meta. You talked about those. You know, those stocks rose. I was about to say precipitously, but it wasn't precipitously, but they, they, they surged last year, not as much as, you know, a lot of stocks you were long. And that's why <laughs> part of the reason the stock market did so well. Some people are saying, oh, but it's, it's you know, the, the, the stock market, bull market, it's very narrow. It's only in the, in the Magnificent Seven. We'll mm -hmm. leave that for a second. Are you bullish, bearish, neutral, overweight or underweight the Magnificent Seven? You know, and I know you've been long NVIDIA, but what about the other six? For a bit, I was uh, just long all of them, right? And then I was I shifted to being long all of them except for Apple. And then for a little bit, I was long all of them and short Apple. And now I've pretty much exited that. I have, I still have, you know, my AI basket on. I still have, you know, my fiscal policy beneficiaries basket. I still have my GLP one basket. But the thing is, you know, Augustin LeBron, who wrote this book, The Laws of Trading, you know, he has a great quote that's take the risk that you're paid for and hedge the rest, right? So uh, you think about, you know, with this AI basket, it's, you know, it's very heavily kind of tilted to cyclicals, right? Like semiconductors are cyclical. And because of that, it, it gives me a lot of risk from a recession. And, 
you know, maybe from a reacceleration of inflation or, or you know, a, a spike in oil. So the way that I see it is, you know, I don't, I'm not paid to take that risk, right? And uh, whenever the market gives me a good opportunity to asymmetrically hedge that risk, I will hedge it, right? The, the, the big decision that I had to make recently was deciding whether or not to hedge against a reacceleration in inflation or a recession, you know, because, you know, are we going to have the stock bond correlation flip back to being, you know, an inverse correlation? Is it going to go negative again? It kind of has started to. And I, that's, you know, in the beginning of the year, I basically had to say, you know, should I hedge a stock market decline that's going to be caused by rising rates in response to a reacceleration in inflation? Or should I hedge a stock market decline that's going to be caused by earnings recession or like a like broader economic weakness and go long by these bond calls? And, you know, when I looked at the market, it, it still seemed like, you know, at least like a couple of weeks ago when tens were hitting, you know, 4.2, it still seemed like most of the asymmetry was on betting on, you know, lower rates. That's what I what I've been doing. It's basically as long as I think that artificial intelligence is going to be a trend that can still be supported, right? That artificial intelligence is going to materialize in, you know, the real world and the overall economy and, you know, materially impact these companies' earnings for for the better. I can basically look at the rest of the market and hedge out the thing the, the risk that I'm you know, I can pay someone else to take that risk for me. You know, like right now, I, I since like on January 19th, I threw out like a bold call. Basically, I said, I think bonds bottomed for the year yeah. on, on you know, January 19th. And I got, I got a lot of pretty cheap calls, you know, I'd like out to March and June. Um, and then rates moved, you know, 40 basis points and, and off something that I think is like, Personally, I think what we've been seeing for the past week in regards to what's going on with, with the banks here, I think it's actually should be taken more seriously than what happened with, you know, Silicon Valley, Signature, First Republic. I know that those banks were bigger than the banks that are concerned right now, but that was interest rate risk, right? That was that was interest rate risk on government obligations, which is, you know, like as soon as that happened, it was you know, clear, you know, the, the government can turn that off with a switch, right? They can- But there were bank uh, runs. We don't have bank runs now, or obviously there's machines here, but- We don't have bank runs. What I'm saying is just that credit risk is so much scarier than interest rate risk because the Fed can pretty much control interest rate risk. First off, they control the interest rates. And second off, you know, the interest rate risk on government obligations, you know, there's, there's no problem with the Fed, you know, having a liquidity facility that can just say, you, you lent us some money and it didn't work out so hot for you. So we're going to let you borrow what you lent us. You yeah. The bank's funding program was not QE. It was rate cuts because you could borrow, you know, one year forward at lower rates because of the inverted curve. And then basically borrow against, you could just pretend that interest rates were still at zero. <laughs> yeah. I mean, well, well it, and then for a while it was, well, not a while for like a month, it was a great arbitrage. You know, like when, when, you know, basically they were borrowing at like OIS plus 10 it became a pretty good arbitrage for the banks. And, you know, then they, they, they shut that shit down real quick. <laughs> Not that quick, but yeah, they did, they did shut that well, shit down. You know, pretty quick. I mean, they're, they're still the government, Jack. So pretty yeah. quick on it. Like, you know, <laughs> that's true at 7 PM. So Citrini, I, I gather you're more bullish on your Citrini decks, your, your portfolio than you are on the general market, the, the, the NASDAQ. Come on, Jack, yeah, Jack, yes. the, the Citrindex. Citrindex. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, I presume if I'd asked you in June of last year, like what about the S and P 500, you would have said bullish. Are you, yeah. what, are, what are you now on the S and P? Bored. Bored. Okay. <laughs> I think we're going to, I think, I think, the outcome in, in the normal distribution is that we're going to have like a pretty choppy and ultimately sideways year. You know, I, I would not be surprised if we close the year, you know, within like plus or minus 5% or like four or 5% of where we were when we closed last year. That is obviously excluding, you know, type of like credit event tail risk, which normally like, like I was, I'm not that can I haven't not been that concerned about something like that happening. And even, you know, with when Silicon Valley Bank collapsed, I had my short on Silicon Valley Bank, which sometimes when I say that people don't believe me. So I'm really glad that I tweeted about it so much in 2022. But you know, I, I covered that short and that money went straight into like buying the Nasdaq and stuff. And I was really not concerned about like the possibility of a recession. And right now I would say that like I'm I'm a little more concerned about it just because I mean, you just had two banks in the span of like 24 hours that are talking about, you know, how 
essentially they have this you know weakness and loan repricing risk and uh, the impact of like higher loan rates on borrowers and you know they're adding to their loan loss provisions and you know maybe it, it seems a little idiosyncratic right now with this you know rent regulated or rent stabilized new york city multifamily but the thing is everyone was so concerned about office right and and we're going to have a you know commercial real estate is going to you know end the economy and i think that like the risks in multifamily got a little bit ignored and again you know i'm not an expert i am a strict generalist but i'm pretty good at talking to people that know what they're talking about what we're starting to see now i think it's a little bit scarier than what we saw in march where you know banks are starting to enter that kind of you know charge off and you know increasing loan loss provisions that like that part of the cycle i don't love seeing that but i think you know there's enough room on bonds where you still can be hedged against it. You know, I'm somewhat jaded because I've been hearing about like loan loss reserves for commercial real estate for, for literally for literally three years before I started this podcast, and it hasn't happened. But it is finally starting to happen, and, and you know, I imagine when there is a financial issue, I don't want to say crisis, you know, 2008, but like it's probably you get bored of hearing about it, and then you're like, oh, it's never going to happen. But it, it does, and that's it does when happen. it happens. Yeah, that's yeah. when it happens. You know, yeah. <laughs> like like and and you know like. And then honestly, I don't think that this is the 1970s. I, 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 and you know, like, you know, it's a market, right? You got to take a view. I can't, I can, you can't like come out and start talking about something and be like, you know, unless you're an economist, right? And then you can be like, well, you know, this thing. But on the other hand, I'm a market participant. I have to take a view. And, uh, you know, there are two views that are presented right now in terms, or I guess three, right? You have the soft landing, you have basically the inflation reacceleration, and then you have like a, like a slowing economy. And I think that the soft landing, at least, you know, to the extent that it's, you know, it's, it's somewhat priced in, right? And I think that it's not great to start seeing, you know, credit risk materializing and, you know, employers are still hoarding labor, but that doesn't mean that they're hiring. And, you know, to me, that seems like an environment where if a couple things go badly, you know, the unemployment rate could spike pretty quickly. So a great point about it's all about weighing the probabilities. And when you ask me the question of what are people saying, what do you, what do you think, where's the economy headed? I can't give you a forecast, but I can say the probability dis distribution of a soft landing is so much higher than it was, say, in the summer or fall of 2022, when the price of oil was over $100 and, uh, you know, consumers sentiments was, was tanking and you had all, all sorts of bad economic indicators, things look a lot better now, but that's reflected in the equity risk premium and you know, credit spreads, all sorts of, of risk metrics. But I'd say, yeah, on a probability basis, the odds of a soft landing are higher. Yeah, I, I might say the odds of a recession are higher than a reacceleration in inflation, but I don't, I don't really pay that much attention to my own beliefs about the economy yeah me me neither <laughs> honestly i mean i'd like I, I figured i had to talk I'm not about, I mean, anyone else. <laughs> jack, jack this show is called forward guidance right i figured we had to like talk about it i'm i'm doing my thing which is uh you know i i think that certain themes in the economy are going to continue you know the, the most interesting theme right now i think is the election you know uh that like that's that's really going to be very interesting i think i'm kind of like trying to you know, I think a lot of us during COVID, we kind of like, it's all kind of a blur. Uh, you know, I think like a lot of what was happening in the market got like memory hold, like in between like, you know, just like sitting inside and like watching Netflix and, you know, just knowing that the market would continue to go up. And so now I'm kind of like, I'm trying to like dig out those parts of my memory and be like, which stocks were doing well because Trump was president, which stocks were just doing well because they were like unlimited QE. But, you know, it it that will be something that drives a, a lot of volatility this year. I think the survey was done in Europe, but it was basically that on average, the electorate, right, is is more unlikely to vote for a candidate or, or like to, to vote in a candidate that has been the administration that's kind of presiding over a period of higher inflation than they are a candidate that's presiding over a period of higher unemployment. Mm-hmm. You know, and I mean, that makes sense, right? I guess, and, you know, inflation affects ev everyone. Unemployment affects, you know, the percent of the population that's unemployed. But wouldn't you say, Citrine, that like most of the time you see people on TV saying the stock market will be greatly affected by geopolitics and this political election and like 0% of the time it actually results in something that matters? I totally agree with you, right? Historically, 
it's kind of the data seems, oh, you know, there's a lot of data on here's how the stock market performs when it's, you know, midterm year and here's how it performs when it's this year and that year. I think that that can also basically be cyclical based on how much impact, you know, fiscal and like the executive branch is having on the economy. And, uh, you know, since, you know, for the past, like, I want to say almost 10 years now, maybe even a little longer, like, like that, the impact has been a lot higher, you know, and I don't think that whatever candidate wins, I don't think that like fiscal spending is going to decline. I think it's just a matter of uh, what they're spending on, you know, and, and that's, that's, you know, if you're playing single name equities, that's a big deal. You know, like if the government is deciding to basically hand this money to, for Mm -hmm. specific purposes, you know, if the Republicans come in and they're like, IRA, done, we're going to take that money, we're going to use it for something else. And we're going to like, like use it to support our other specific things, you know, the, the, you know, that changes the changes the environment of the market significantly, it might not change the overall returns of the index too much. But it can definitely change the returns of your portfolio based on the companies that you know, you're, you're long or short, right? Tell us about your basket of What's it called? Basically, fiscal beneficiaries, infrastructure buildouts. What are those types of companies? You could, you know, mention stocks. I'm like pathologically apolitical, right? Like, I know a lot of people say that they don't care about politics. I, I, I truly oh, like, like, wonderful. like Jack. I, I hate it. I, I, like, it is the least interesting thing in the world to me. So basically, what because I'm trying to take that like apolitical market focused aspect and essentially go into the companies that have benefited from fiscal spending and you know do two things which are the companies that are going to benefit regardless of who wins from continued fiscal spending which i think will continue to be you know at least higher than has has been historically and more of a a factor that impacts the market but i think what i'm trying to look at also is you know what are the things that the United States as a country, especially, is, has to spend on, right? Like, like what, like what are the things that pose kind of, you know, unacceptable risks, regardless of what party you're in? Like, you know, a big one of those things is like the electrification infrastructure and kind of, you know, basically the electric grid. You know, the, the infrastructure in general in this in this country is it's not doing great, you know, comparatively and. That's something that, like, regardless of who comes into office, it, you know, it's going to need to be spent on. It's going to need to be taken care of. Like, the, these are this is kind of the reason why we pay taxes, right? And like, that's what the taxes should be spent on. And the the the, the obvious there are obvious beneficiaries there. I think, like, you know, you have like Eaton, for example, and then you know you have the other thing is they're probably going to continue to benefit you know, these like contractors and design companies. And, you know, uh, of course, they're industrials, they're very cyclical. But I think that when you look at it, you kind of want to narrow down this theme and say, okay, it's very likely that we continue to spend, it's likely that the spending is altered somewhat based on who's in office. So maybe I'm going to shy away a little bit from these, you know, kind of uh, sub themes that are very specific to whether it's a Democrat or Republican o- in office, but I'm going to, you know, really go after the names that benefit from these wider themes of like fiscal spending, just in general being higher as we kind of, you know, go into this laissez faire at, at kind of, I think Marco Pavich calls it the Buenos Aires consensus, you know, and, and kind of, you know, find out the, com- you know, if you can't beat them, join them. Right. Yeah. But I imagine you have to do so much research, not just on a technology like AI, which is you know by itself very, very difficult, but also who's going to pass what, when, which company is going to benefit? How do you know? I mean, it has so much research. Yeah. And I just want to step back and ask you, how do you, as someone who is a generalist, you're not a specialist, self-described, not a specialist in anything, not an expert you know, in, in anything, but you can learn so much about it to really have an edge in a vast array of industries. That is very difficult. And, you know, I would not recommend anyone who has a full-time job, like try and do that, put, you know, so much, you know, their, 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 their savings, you know, a lot of their savings behind it. But as someone, you know, you who has, you know, you know, been successful doing it, what is kind of something you've discovered? Because let's, uh, let's take an example. So you have, okay, so you, okay, the theme is fiscal, the government is going to print all this money and build stuff in the US, roads, bridges that we at last need. Beneficiaries are that our construction companies, design companies. Okay, so you get your Bloomberg terminal or, or your whatever, and you find companies in this sector 
And then you have to make a list of competitors. Okay, you look them up. You start looking at what do you start looking at their presentations and then their quarterly reports. At what point do you figure out, oh, this is a legit company, this is a middle of the road company, or this is a shit go? Well, well you know, you, you skipped a step, the step there that I think is it, not to like be too much of a Soros stan again, but like I am, right? So the, the basically he used to say this thing that was, you know, I'll become an expert in anything in 48 hours if I, have, you know, if I have to trade it. And he, another thing is basically he called himself an insecurity analyst, right? That like, he's so constantly paranoid about being wrong, uh, that, uh, it instills this sense of humility where, uh, if you're constantly thinking that you're wrong, you're going to seek out you know, the opinions of people that are more likely to be right. Uh, like when, you know, when I wrote this thing about fiscal, uh, the first thing that I did was uh, I got in touch with people that knew about this, you know, like I, Steve Moran, for example, much more knowledgeable about this mm -hmm. than I am. Steve Ho, too, mm -hmm. you know, like as an economist, you know, and, and spent a lot of time like talking with those people. I, I talked with a lot of people in the sectors that are directly impacted you know i talk to people that are doing you know the electrification you know like people that are dealing with the housing supply stuff like that and you know so that's where it has to start right because you know a big a big theme was basically solar and you know so like once you know once i narrow down these themes what i'll do is you know you can create like a broad kind of overview of like here are the names that could benefit right and then you know solar for example right uh now, what are the names that are most likely to benefit regardless of, you know, as, as long as there's continued fiscal spending, what are the factors that are, that are impacting them? And what are the companies that are just quality companies? You know, like one of my, my two favorite kind of like solar related stocks have been Flex and Next Tracker. Next Tracker was a spinoff. They are just quality companies. And it's the same thing with anything you know with super micro or you know like you 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 find a quality company that you know is not going to you know snatch defeat from the jaws of victory you know some companies are out there and they never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity you find the companies that are that are that have like a great track record of recognizing that they have a tailwind and taking advantage of it right and that you know have the leverage kind of like the you know i mean sometimes are they the best companies you know like i had i had a one with the AI was it was a smaller company, you know, at at the time at least, called Applied Optoelectronics, right? It was you know very levered, what you know the kids would call a shit co, but you know it was a company that had a history of basically knowing when to take advantage of a tailwind and knowing when to take advantage of a theme, and this was like eight eight hundred G optical, great theme in in relation to AI, you know, like I, I don't want to get into it, but you know, you can read the stuff that I've written about AI about why it's so good for, you know, this specific subsector. And, you know, so, you know, it, was it a quality company No, but was it one that was likely to benefit from this in, in like a very outsized way with the leverage that it had and, you know, the operating leverage? Absolutely. You know, same thing with, you know, so that's kind of how I narrow it down. And, you know, it's kind of a, it's a process of, uh, elimination right basically you know what the first you know i'm going to do the research right and i'm going to do the research in a way where i i do a lot of speaking to people who are much smarter about me <laughs> on these specific topics than i i could ever be right some of these people you know like with the glp1 stuff i spoke with like five endocrinologists right and you, like you know how much work it takes to be an endocrinologist right like i i can never even hope to replicate that level of knowledge but I can speak with them. Right. And, and I think it's important to like speak with people at length. And uh, I think that these expert networks kind of do people a little bit of a disservice because they give them a sense that like they know what they're talking about when like a 30 minute, one hour conversation, you, you have no chance, right? Like, like you, you, you have to really kind of have like a, you know, a few conversations of, like on the overall idea first to kind of Know yeah, where and then the do idiom. research in between the first and the second meeting. So you come to the second meeting with more knowledge to then exactly. be or prove. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I, I do that with macro stuff too, right? Like, like if I'm speaking with economists or, mm -hmm. you know, a big thing with the macro especially is there is a disconnect between like traders and the central bankers that set the policy. The central bankers are much more likely to be like academic. And that's like a certain way of thinking and a certain way of being trained. And like, you know, when you get like a PhD in economics and, and you know, as like a trader, uh, you have no hope of like 
understanding that kind of the qualia that they are, are ascribing to this. So, you know, I think like a big part of it is basically being humble enough to, you know, know what you don't know. But with with the fiscal stuff, I think it's going to be a really interesting year with the election. And it's going to, you know, uh, it's going to be, you know, maybe some other stuff gets added, you know, like, like these candidates are going to go after the kind of boomer demographic, right? There, and uh, maybe that entails, maybe we see some kind of like, like these companies that cater to like geriatrics or, you know, like assisted living, senior, senior living, se- senior services. Maybe we see that kind of, you know, come out when based on like the, the promises that are made or the, the facts that our economy is aging and, you know, it's, it's going to be good for a candidate to try to, you know, take advantage of that and like, like address that. It'll be interesting at least. <laughs> Yeah, I guess how how do you know when you're onto something, both in terms of the trend and the stock or the basket? So I'll give you an example. People say demographics. Like, why do you believe believe A demographics? Why do you believe believe B demographics? And obviously, demographics is very important, but it is extremely complex and acts with extremely long lag. So, for example, when I first entered this business, everyone was saying that bond yields were going to go down and they're going to go down below zero because we have declining demographics. Well, actually. Guess what? In the U.S., the, these millennials they like to buy houses, and and <laughs> you know, so you were wrong about that. And you know, people who study demographics professionally were wrong about that. So why would someone who just like you know spends yeah. an hour on it be right about that? So how do you know the trend is right? That's an example of a trend being wrong. You well, know, I think I think you're really gonna like this answer. Better. There are a ton of themes that are like they are themes, but they don't work in the stock market. They haven't worked in the stock market, right? Like water, or you know, like demographics kind of you know it's not enough for a theme to just be a theme right like you need you need a couple things first off you need a favorable macro backdrop whenever i do these baskets i'm not going to spend all the time to do this if it's like if i think it's going to be an environment where it's just not going to work ai was a thing before chat gpt right ai was you know ai and machine learning have been around for quite some time and I was aware of it, but I, I wasn't going to do the work and create a basket and b- before like you had a tipping point, which, which was ChatGPT. And then you had a favorable macro backdrop, which was like disinflationary growth. Right. And or with the GLP-1 basket, right. The, with GLP-1, GLP-1s. Like Eli Lilly, Novo Nordisk making what's it, Ozempic. That kind of right. Thing. Exa- yeah. Exactly. And, and, and the way that I want to like cap, if I have a good enough theme where I can really narrow down, you know, a basket of companies that benefit from it, and then a basket of companies that are hurt by it, what I'm going to do is basically, okay, Eli Lilly, Nova Nordisk, you know, the, these are obvious longs here over the, you know, they are going to benefit, right? They're, they're the, the kind of archetypal beneficiary on the short side, right? You know, of the layup for me was basically, you know, bariatric surgery and then like CPAP machines, you know, like 70% of people with obstructive sleep apnea are obese. And if Eli Lilly and Novo Nordisk are making drugs that are like effective and actually can, you know, make people not obese, but, you know, just because that's the case, you know, that can take years to play out. Why, when do I want to put this on? Well, like med tech is like very sensitive to, you know, like the long rate. Right. So it was like it was I basically put it on when when it was like pretty clear that we were going to have, you know, the the long rate kind of go up precipitously because then I have more than one tailwind. Right. I have the tailwind from the theme. But I but also, you know, I have like, you know, you look at like how Insulate or ResMed or, you know, Teleflex, like how these companies reacted to you know, higher rates on the long end. And so that's basically what I'm saying is, you know, once I have a tipping point, like a, uh, like something that like, whether it's ChatGPT or whether it's like Ozempic getting mentioned at the Oscars, or, you know, if it's like, like people becoming increasingly aware of like fiscal spending and, and like the, the, you know, political environment with the big three or, you know, whatever it is. And then once I have that, I'm going to look at basically the macro environment and I'm going to say, you know, what are the, what's the likelihood that I can put this on and I'm going to get kind of, you know, a little extra lift, right. From also, you know, macro helping me. And with Jerry at, like with the demographic stuff, Jerry, a lot of these companies are, you know, REITs, right. Like that they're basically, you know, skilled nursing facilities and like assisted, you know, assisted living sniffs and alfs and those are not going to do well you know if rates are going up a ton but like if rates are coming down it like like in the way that they have right and like a like a disinflationary growth you know they'll probably do pretty well 
And if it's during an election year where like people are going to be more focused on uh, demographically, you know, and, you know, focused on social security and like, like the, the kind of demographic issues that we're facing, it's going to be, you know, a little bit more likely that people start executing like this, right? Like, like it's all, it's fine and well to identify a theme, but I'm not just going to be out here writing about, you know, like every single theme that I see because like it's a market, right? Wow. <laughs> you, you, you need, you need at least a few, you know, you need, you want to be early, but you don't want to be alone. And what about when you have a view on a stock and A, you the fundamentals continue to appear good, the thesis, you still get it, but the stock doesn't go up or it goes down, or you reevaluate, you know, something something causes your, your thesis to change. Yeah, I mean that's like risk management, right? Like I don't if I get into a trade, I I, I already know what my risk is gonna be. You know, like I'm not I'm and I will put on a trade multiple times. You know, like like if I if I, I first off, I'm not gonna put on a trade unless I think it's asymmetric, you know, unless I I think I'm basically, you know, risking one to make, you know, four, five, ten. And then I need to make sure that my actual risk and like what I stick to represents and respects that asymmetry. Because if if you you're getting the trades that you think are you know one on the downside and you know ten on the upside, that's great. You can afford to be long. You can afford to be wrong, you know, a ton. Like you you can be you know wrong four times, and if on the fifth time you're right, you're still going to make money. But not going to work if uh, you're not actually enforcing that risk when you're down one, right? So what I kind of, you know, if I see a good trade and and then, you know, I put it on, it doesn't work, you know, I, I take it off. I'll, I'll get into it again. You know, like, like I was, I did this with the yen, right. Where it was like, I, when we were, we were at like <clears throat> going above like 150, 151, 152 around like the bank of Japan, they're kind of, they were kind of doing their, you know, our, will we, won't we yield curve control normalization stuff. But, you know, I, I shorted USD JPY three times it took you know uh, like a 50 bit loss on each one of them and then the last time that i put it on you know i covered it i put it on to like 151 and then covered it you know like 142 and and that makes up for the rest of them right so, yeah so i've got a question so so you always know when you're going to get out so there's two, if it goes up always. how much is it going to go up before you get out and then if it goes down, how much? So so basically, your your you know, your stop loss or your stop gain. Did you do you always stick to it so you never change it? So in other words, I'm going to buy this stock at ten dollars. Once it goes to nine dollars and seventy cents, I'm going to sell it. But I think it's going to be a five bagger. So it gets to fifty dollars. What if it goes to thirty dollars? But you think the, it's gone ahead of itself, but the fundamentals actually don't justify that. Then do you sell or do you stick to the? I'm constantly going to reevaluate the risk that I'm taking today, right? Just because I put on the trade and, you know, the stop was, you know, whatever, a couple of points lower than where, where I got in. When I, when I, the price target is hit, right, I'm going to reevaluate it, but I will, it's, it's kind of like entering a new trade, right? If you're going to change your parameters, you know, you're, you're, you have to update where, where you're willing to risk now. Right. Right. But what if it doesn't go to what if it goes to thirty dollars, but your mm -hmm. top is fifty dollars and it's not there yet, but you think you want to sell anyway? Is that allowed or no? Mm, that's a really good way to like mess yourself up. I'd let, like like you know Jimmy Jude on Twitter. He's got a great saying that I that I love. That's basically like if you get on the bus, you know, and it's and it's going to California. Why are you getting off in Chicago? You know, and like, the, the, listen, there are reasons to get off in Chicago. Maybe the bus is on fire, right? Maybe, maybe like, maybe the driver's on meth. But like, unless you, you know, just just because you have gotten part way, that's not a like a like a sufficient reason to to get out. You know, and and I do have like concentration limits inside of my portfolio, right? Like with Super Micro, it was you know, I mean, heartbreaking how much money I could have made if I had just you know. The, the, I, you know, I had like a 300 bit position, 300 like basis points of my, if I had just put that on and left it alone and, you know, I mean the amount of, you know, like it would have been a lot better, but I have portfolio concentration limits. So, you know, every time it went above six, you know, I'm kind of scaling it down and, you know, but the thing is like you, you basically have to cut off the fat tails, right? So like I, I, I want to make sure that like, I'm not too exposed on, you know, that a fat tail on, 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 you know, the left tail. And I don't want to truncate the right tail 
but I don't want, you know, I don't basically want to make it so that my whole portfolio is going to take a huge drawdown. It's like this one stock messes up. Right. And the way that I view it is, you know, if I, if I get into a stock and, you know, it doubles and I'm able to, you know, like at least take off half and kind of like pull my cost basis out of it, then my, you know, my psychological state gets a little bit more conducive to long-term returns. I see what you mean. And yes, I know exactly what you mean when you've made so much money on a trade that you, you actually are empowered psychologically to make even more money because you're not worked out. Whereas if you lose money, you're just, you're, you're, you got to get out. Okay. That makes sense. So then what do you say that actually the limiting in the same way that like banks aren't limited by, to make loans by reserves or limited by capital, like actually like your, if, you know, if you think a stock, if you think something's a trade is going to be a five bagger or a 10 bagger, your limit is not when this becomes a five bagger sell. It's the limiting factor is actually this stock has become too big as a percentage of the portfolio. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay, right. Exactly. And, and and that that kind of also gives you protection against like, you know, when it's like when the stock is going up just, you know, because of like beta, you know, like like you don't want to, you know, you, you want your whole you want your actual thesis to play out. And, you know, it, it's it's nice when like beta is on your side. But if you have a thesis and it's basically, you know, I think that this company is going to expand earnings so and so and it goes up, you know, a uh, you know, a decent amount before that happens, but you're, you should still be in the trade for your thesis, right? So, you know, if you're you, probably if that happens, your overall portfolio is going to go up, maybe the concentration is going to stay the same, you know, and like when your thesis starts playing out, then like the concentration will start to go up. It's kind of and and you know, also, I, I can basically this is the reason why my portfolio is like split into baskets, right, where I create these baskets, and the, most of them are long short. And the P&L of these baskets starts to let me know what people are thinking of about specific themes, right? Like, uh, and kind of how the themes are doing too, like around earnings, right? Like that's kind of the, the AI basket. Every single time that there were like significant, you know, chunks of earnings, it would go up a ton, right? And, and you know, just looking at that, I can, it's, it's like a quick kind of, I can look at like the intraday p and and basically say, okay, you know, AI seems to be, you know, materializing here. But really, you know, at the end of the day, it's just uh, like, you. no matter what you do, no matter how smart you make something sound, it's still a question of how much are you risking versus how much can you make, you know, and the, it, the way that I see it is kind of if you buy something for a dollar, right, and you think it's going to go to 10, and then you sell it at seven, you're giving yourself a $3 handicap on your next trade. Right, even even though you actually would have sold it at five dollars for risk management purposes, you just you would have sold half at, at at five. Because of the psychological impact, right? If I know, let's say, you know, I'm probably always going to sell about half of my position, you know, if it doubles, right? Mm -hmm. Or you know, maybe if I'm really confident, I'll wait until like you know, just so that I can, you know, if I catch like the next you know monster in 1997. You know, I have a really good friend who was PM in like 97, 98. His highest conviction stock was Monster, you know, Monster <laughs> Energy, right? Uh, the best performing stock of all time. Yeah. Yeah. The best performing stock of all time. And he, and he, like, he pitched it to his, or no, I think he was, I think it was an analyst at the time. He pitched it to his PM. His PM, you know, rejected it. And he was so convinced that, you know, he went to his PM and said, okay, can I put it on myself? He took, basically all his savings, put it into the stock, you know, like, like, like 70 or 80 grand, just put it into the stock. And then he sold all of it when it was a four X. Right. And I'm um, pretty sure he would be a billionaire right now. Right. <laughs> but, and, and that's the saddest story ever. And, but, you know, if you think about, well, what if he had sold, you know, half of it when it had doubled and then, you know, he, he knew that like his, the savings that he put in were safe and maybe, you know, maybe, the stock was zero. He's no worse off than he was before. And, uh, you know, maybe he wouldn't have been a billionaire, but, you know, you tell me what the difference is between, you know, having, you know, $200 million and, or $300 million and, uh, you know, 900 million. I don't really care about that. <laughs> you know, like I, the, the idea is basically when you find something really good, the, the word, I would rather be wrong than be right. And like constantly second guessing myself because the, the worst thing is when you are right. The only thing you, it gives you so many opportunities to mess it up when all you had to do was do nothing. That, that makes sense. So let, let's now turn to some themes that 
they either have half worked or haven't worked. The one thing that comes to my mind is, is, is China. So you were long Chinese assets. What was your thesis there? When did you have it? And then how did you go about you know, pulling out of the position and sort of changing your thesis? And then we can get into what do you think about China now? I was long India, short China for all of the second half of 2021 and most of 2022. It was, you know, like I, I really loved that trade, right? It, because that was like, like 2022 was such a tough year. It was so great to like have this thing that like kept going up. And what happened essentially was, you know, I was really concerned with like the zero COVID stuff. And I saw that they we're going to pivot, right? There was, you can look on Twitter. I think the the person that really called this best, I, I think his handle is Shanghai macro strategist. And, you know, he had been on the money so far. And and he said, you know, like, it's looking like they're going to pivot. The, the writing was kind of on the wall. So I basically got out of my India long. I flipped, I, you know, I covered the short. I basically did a stop and reverse on China. And it was great, right? Like, like, you know, when I do some, I don't really use indices that often. I, I would much rather create my own basket, you know? So I did that and, you know, China went nuts. I mean, it, it like from like the end of October 22 to like the end of January, it was, it was such a, you know, I was like, and, and you have to realize like in that moment, right. I basically had on this like macro trade that just killed it for like a year and a half. And then I got out at exactly the right time. And I was like, I am a macro genius, right? Like, <laughs> you can't touch this, right? And then the thing is, you know, I obviously I was bearish on China before that. And I was really basically playing a short squeeze, but I kind of let myself, you know, I, I let myself kind of like buy into it. And I was like looking at historical and I'm like, oh my God, my cost base is so good. It, at the end of January, you know, I, I said, Okay, you know, you know, on my side, it was like one of the first articles I ever wrote on my Substack. It, that was like, okay, it's time to like take profit in China and like you know rotate a little bit. And I never, I took the profit right, and I never got back in. And 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 like because I figured, okay, if it's going to start going down, I'm going to make a lot more money timing the bottom. Because the thing is, in that like three months between like you know the beginning of November and the end of January, I made more money than I had on the entire you know long India short China trade just because it was so rapid and I had like options yeah. and stuff. And I, yep, and yep. I basically, you know, and I was like, oh, you know, this is like a, like a crowded short that went a time in the bottom is really gonna, you know, this is going to be great. I'll, I'll be patient about it. And then I tried to time the bottom and, you know, it kept going down. I got out of China long in the end of January 23. I got back in, in at the end of August. Right. And uh, so, so far, everything you've described has worked. Get, getting well, well, then, right? Like then, like like what, yeah, what I what I should have done, right? I should have instead of just taking profit and getting out and like trying to like pick the bottom again, I should have basically done another stop and reverse and flipped short China. But I was like, I was like intoxicated by the gains that I had made that I figured, oh, it's not even worth you know trying to like short China again. I'm gonna like like wait, and I didn't put back on the India trade. Which, I understand, I mean, but what were the fun? What were the fundamentals of flipping short in January? Even though that would have been the right trade. I mean, like, like the thing is, nothing really. Like the only thing that changed about the China story back then was zero COVID, right? They still had, you know, they still had the three Ds, right? Like debt, deflation, demographics, right? It, 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 the there was nothing that had like fundamentally changed other than like you know they had they in. September of, of 2022, they were shooting themselves in both foots. And now like, maybe they were only shooting themselves in one or like they were using a smaller caliber on their left foot. Like, you know, it, it's basically and but the thing is, you know, when you have like a trade that really doesn't work or really works, it kind of blinds you to wow. to like, being able to get back into it, which is okay, like in stocks, right? Like in stocks, you can you can be long a stock. And like, you know, it doesn't work or it works really well. And like, you, you, you get like a weird kind of bias and maybe you never look at it again. That's fine, right? There are so many stocks in macro, like there are only so many trades, you know, and basically, you know, what I should have done at that point was basically, you know, recognize that it was a short squeeze, flipped, you know, short on China, gotten back into the India long. But I had basically, you know, because I was long China, I was looking for things that confirmed my my priors and got like pessimistic on the India growth story, which, you know, is playing out. You know, I think, you know, India really, I mean, so 
like you look at like the ratios, right? Like the P ratios on like the index and stuff and it looks so overvalued. But the thing is, it doesn't get much better than like population growth. Yeah. And like and, and like being like geopolitically orthogonal when like people are trying to pivot away from China, like it's a it's a good story. And I'm like a story narrative based investor. And so missing that was, you know, painful. And then, you know, I tried to pick the bottom on China again. And I, I did it in August. The one thing that obviously that has not worked, right, that really has not worked. <laughs> you know, I. I really thought that like, I was like, okay, you know, this is going to be the bottom, right? The, the, the thing that I, I, I was like, oh, over the weekend, they're going to, they're going to do stimulus, you know, and like, uh, you know, it's, it never happened. Right. And I thought that the bottom, so like right now was going to be when Chua, you know, Asia, Asia Genesis, they blew up trading long Hang Seng, short Nikkei, which is fun, yeah, long, long China, short Japan blew up. Yeah. Hedge fund. Yeah. I mean, well, but, but it's an interesting story, you know, because you think about like why that happened, uh, it, if you're like an older PM in China, you know how unfathomable it has to be for you to to think that like China is going to go down so much, right? Like like ten percent a month, and that at the same time Japan is just going to squeeze and like reach new all time highs. I mean, you came up in like Japan deflation asset bubble burst and like Chinese yeah. ascendancy and the, and the thing just gets flipped on you. Like I, I honestly, I can get it right. Like obviously the guy was wrong, but like I can get where, it, and it's like, you know, you sympathize with people where it's like, yeah, I can see it. Like you were biased and you messed up, but I can see where this bias came from. Right. It's not like it was totally unreasonable. The one redeeming factor, the reason that like, you know, I've been able, like I'm, I'm still in China. I have a stop on it. Basically I have a basket that I put on in at the end of August it's very like a picky, choosy kind of like, I basically call it like the Chinese equity barbell, right? Where you have like, where you're like pretty slated towards like beneficiaries of supply side stimulus if it materializes. And then you have a little bit on the the other side that's focused on like demand side stimulus. Luckily, Pinduoduo was one of those yeah. names, which is like one of the, you know, Pinduoduo and NetEase were in there, which was a redeeming factor. It's probably the reason why it didn't go down so much, but yeah, um, NetEase is best performing Chinese stock of all time. Some of that is that it was went you know IPO'd so early, and then Pinduoduo has surpassed Alibaba as the biggest retailer and online retailer in China. What, yeah, what do you think and, about the, the big ones that are in the index? So the, the tech went like uh, Tencent, Alibaba, JD.com, you know Meituan. As- I think really China is a macro story right now. And like over the past four months, you know, picking, trying to pick like outperforming stocks in China is like trying to put a campfire out with your face, you know, like, like maybe it'll work, but like, it's not like, you, you know, you, there are better things you could be doing. Well, wait, I don't understand that because there, okay, there's beta, there's what the, the trend is with the, whatever the trend is, you know, and then there's alpha. So like AI has worked, you know, the stocks that you've picked and the longs and the shorts, like that's outperformed. Why is there's no alpha in China? Like, like, do I have to perform better than Alibaba? Is that why is that not alpha? Sure, Where, yeah, it? it's it's just like there's so much risk that you have no insight into, right? In terms of like, you know, what the, the you know maybe today, maybe tomorrow, you know, the the CCP decides to like video games are evil. How's that going to work for like netties? You know, like 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 so far it's been great, you know, like, but uh, or like maybe they decide that like you know they're putting a ban on like you know manufacturing like tchotchke shit, you know, like that's yeah. not going to be great for Timu. Or the entire fintech industry is illegal. Yeah, exactly. Like with, it's, with, it's with that breaking current regulations, but maybe you know we well, have an exactly. Well, but but regardless, you know, like like I I don't you know people say like China's uninvestable and like I mean yeah like there are risks there are obviously risks there are risks in, like investing in any EM and like if if China is able to turn it around it'll be you know one of the it'll be an amazing trade. It's so cheap relatively. And, but the thing that the kind of like, you know, right now, I think my China bas- China basket is it because the basket was basically, like I said, it was, it was these two categories. And then it was, I was short two or three times as much notional as I was long equities on the Chinese renminbi. Right. So I was, because I was basically saying there are a couple scenarios. The one that helps me is, is basically China decides to stimulate right and the one that hurts me is china doesn't decide to stimulate but in both those scenarios the yuan is not doing great right because they're either going to have to like print money to stimulate their economy right or they're going to have to not stimulate their economy their economy is going to like you know continue to like experience capital flight and so basically 
the way that I put it on was like, it was kind of funded more, more, it was like FX hedged plus, you know, two times. Right. Uh And so that kind of provided a little bit of cushion. It was, it, it made me able to like stay in the trade a little bit longer right now. I think it's down, you know, I'm down like 7%. And like, if it gets down below 10%, then I'm out for China. That's good. I mean, yeah, no, I mean, it, it was good, but it's also like, like uh, over the same period of time, you know, I think the NASDAQ was up like, you know, it's because it, it's like opportunity cost, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like, like, like it's like 10% of my portfolio that could have, you know, been allocated to these other things that were up, you know, 20, 25% at the same time. And it's just kind of sitting there, you know, slowly bleeding. I'm not ready to give up on it yet because it hasn't hit my stop. That's, that's like the, that's the thing, right? Once you set the risk, you know, I'm not going to get off in Chicago here. I'm going to, it's like, like I, I'm either going to be proven wrong by the market or right, but I'm not going to like, you know, tell myself before that happens. But the question is, in Ch- is China, is the bus driver smoking meth? I mean, yeah, dude. <laughs> like <yeah. laughs> Every decision he makes is just, oh God, it's a, it's a tough one. I mean, I have my stop in, right? And, and that's, you know, that's kind of the thing where, if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It's down. Obviously, I've been wrong so far. That's the game, right? You know, I, the way that I see it is, it, it's an asymmetric risk. And the thing with asymmetric risks is, if you're if you're playing them, just by their nature, some of them are not going to work. You know, but they they afford you a lot of room to maneuver because the ones that do work pay for a lot of the ones that don't work. Right? That's just it, it's like it, it's. You know, if I if I can be right on AI and I'm risking one and, you know, AI makes me 10 and then I get into China and I lose, you know, one or two on China, you know, whatever. Right. But like as long as it's as long as I think and view it as asymmetric and you look at the valuations in China and it's like, you know, I don't know, maybe maybe he dies. Right. It's like always a possibility. And like and, and then maybe, you know, like like the problem now is nobody cares enough to be long, but nobody cares enough to be short. So there's no fuel for when good things happen of like people getting short squeezed. So, you know, it's a tough one, but you know, we'll see what happens with it. The world's leading institutional crypto conference is just a few weeks away. Digital Asset Summit London is running from March 18th to the 20th, and the lineup is absolutely stacked. Danny Masters, Mark Yusko, Dan Tapiero, Michael Howell, Joseph Wang, Need I Go On, Goldman's going to be there, City, JP Morgan, BlackRock, Chainlink, A16Z, Aave, Grayscale, Brevin Howard, Bloomberg, basically everybody. So click the link in the description to see just how packed out our guest list is and use code FG10 to get 10% off your tickets. Thanks. Let's get back to the interview. One more thing, right? With China, I had two trades, right? One was the Chinese equity barbell thing, right? And what was the The real estate, right? the, The other one was the property bonds, right? And I was very selective with the, you know, with the kind of property bonds. And uh, honestly, I mean, that worked, right? You have like, like the big one that that I've recommended a couple. And uh, it was like, you know, it was two, basically, one was a co guard bond that stayed flat. And the other one was RKPF overseas, you know, road KG, and the, like the the 2024s, and that doubled. So and you know, the the it's it got it at like a very high yield to maturity. It's like, a you know, so that overall play, you know, did kind of work and, you know, was like part of, it's part of like how I'm viewing my China P&L, right? So when I say like when China goes below 10%, but anyway, what, what, <laughs> what are we ending on? I don't want to oh, talk about China you're, anymore. You're, it hurts my feelings. <laughs> what about on AI? Like you, you think this is a long, a long-term trend, but you know, where, where do you think we are in the George Soros bubble? Phase. Oh, basically, I think that we are probably we're still on the upswing, right? Like there's there's still room for things to get. There's no way we are at like the dot com bubble level. You know, we're modeling everyone with two cell phones, and you know, like we're not at like the pets dot com. You know, like or Sun Microsystems trading at you know billion times earnings. Like we're not there yet. I do think that like the risk is that as the trend kind of shifts, basically it will get increasingly difficult to generate alpha just being long AI because what AI is will kind of shift from basically the companies that are, you know, enabling it to happen. I mean, you know, in a very broad sense to, you know, more specific kind of, you know, the picks and shovels will probably narrow. I think like the best things there are basically, you know, memory and optical and the 
you know, we're going to have to get more proactive about like looking at the actual adopters, right? Like the, and the, the democratizers and the ones that are actually going to benefit from AI and, and create new use cases. And I do think that we will see a lot new, a lot of new use cases. I don't think that chatbots are like the future of AI, right? I think that like, as these large language models, you know, as like, as compute gets a little bit less expensive and the large language models like gets kind of commoditized, what's going to happen is you're basically going to have a broadening out, right? But it's going to be a lot less concentrated in like the GPU companies. And I think that there is still room there. There, It's going to get a little bit more difficult, right? So like, like that's, that's what I would say now. That, that makes sense. And I, I know you got to go, but I think that you really are a fundamentals person. And that's why I wanted to let the audience know about that. When you first started talking about like the first thing I do when I think it's a bubble is, is I buy is you right now, you focus on the fundamentals and then you put your frame of where we are in the market cycle on top of that. Whereas I would say that if you're truly thinking about the market cycle and let's say you're right on the fundamentals that the, the who's going to be a, a winner, an AI beneficiary in terms of fundamental narrows, if the bubble, we enter a true speculative mania phase Actually, the quality stocks, the stocks that you know you and other you know people who know what they're talking about are underwriting and investing in, will actually not go up as much as the companies that like are exactly. talking about on TV. You know exactly, and I and I'm prepared for that. I have yeah. I have you know I have my basket of like quote unquote AI stocks, right? And you know and you know if that if that's how the market is progressing, then okay, you know. But right now, you know the way that the way that it's progressed has been pretty eminently reasonable, right? I don't, I, I, I don't see anything that makes me say, oh my God, this is insane. Are there a lot of things that are probably at fair value right now? Yeah. But I don't think, I think that if we're really going to go into a bubble, we're going to st- have to start seeing a lot more crazy inflated, you know, analyst expectations. And that's basically how it's going to play out. And lack of delivery and stocks still going up. Ex- and, exactly. And everyone's exactly. talking about it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, will, I mean, Citrini, yeah. Citrini, we'll leave it there. People can find you on Twitter at Citrini7. And just quickly tell us people about your, your sub stack and what people can find there. Oh, yeah. You can check it out at CitriniResearch.com. I focus on basically publish my own portfolio, which I you know jokingly call the Citrindex. It's a it's comprised of you know the various baskets that I think you're capturing these trends. And then I basically you know, trade around it to kind of hedge the risks that I don't want to take. And that's all on there. You can, I update those themes. I, you know, talk about what I'm thinking. And I also do a little series that might interest your viewers called Global Macro Trading for Idiots, where not, not to, well, you know, whatever. We're all idiots sometimes. Yeah, that, yeah that's but, <laughs> You know, this, I've, only, I've only done, you know, I did it. I think you, you did interview him, you know, super macro. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. He's great. Yeah. Yeah, he wrote he wrote the last one with me uh, well, on know you know it, on basically you know global macro trading for idiots on FX and then the one I did before that was on you know trading the yield curve and the one I'm doing right now is on silver futures. So uh, you know it's 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 pretty diverse. It's very nice. Well, yeah, I just want to say as you know it's true for all episodes, but especially this one that you know nothing that you or I say is investment advice and you know you're just talking about your investment process, what you found interesting, what has worked for you, but you know, by no means are you making like a recommendation or anything. I just think it's also important to say that like the, what you're doing is you, you, you're you playing above the rim and you're, you're doing what a lot of you know, institutional hedge funds do where they have teams and dozens of people working on these things and like people who are doing a full-time job and like, you know, are spending an hour a week trading are, are not going to have the same results, you know, and so they should be aware of that. And, you know, you know, the, like this should be of, of, of interest first before anyone becomes a practitioner. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, thank you again for having me on. And, you know, congratulations on deciding to call me uh, the world's best AI stock picker on our first interview that I had nothing to do with that. That was not how I presented myself. But uh, yeah, I, considering- I chose that title. But so far, it's, we'll, we'll see how it does <laughs> next time we're on. All right. All right. Talk to you later, Jack. Thanks. Thanks for watching. Remember to check out vanek.com slash hodl fg to learn more about the Vanek Bitcoin Trust, ticker HODL. Reminder that Forward Guidance episodes are available on all podcast apps and on Twitter, where I post them regularly at JackFarley96. Thanks again. Until next time.